Yeah, I'm Alex Fialo. I'm a curator and art historian. I am a co-curator of the Michael Richards retrospective, Michael Richards, Are You Down? with Melissa Levin. How did you find Michael Richards? I worked in New York for eight years as a curator and arts administrator and collaborated with Melissa Levin, who was the vice president for cultural programs at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. And Melissa and I co-curated multiple exhibitions for Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's um, Arts Center at Governor's Island. And we were always interested in thinking about Lower Manhattan's cultural histories. And Michael Richards had a studio, his artist studio on the 92nd floor of Tower One through a residency program with Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, LMCC, their worldviews program. So we were thinking institutionally about what artists were of interest to LMCC to curate for the third show that we had curated um, in the Governor's Island space and didn't know much more about Michael's work than Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian, which was really widely produced on the internet, and decided to embark on a process of getting to know his practice better, which ultimately led to us calling his cousin, Don Dale, who lives in upstate New York, two hours north of New York City. And she had held on to what we now understand is the majority of Michael's sculptures, and they were in boxes that had been unopened for 15 years since his passing on September 11th. And Melissa and myself and a team of curators and staff from LM, or, uh, art handlers and staff from LMCC started opening the boxes. And we came to really understand what was in the garage, which was a lot of pieces of sculptures, which we didn't really know how they became artworks. And then after two days in the garage in the winter of 20, 16, January, February, we also did analog research at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Bronx Museum of the Arts, where Michael had artist residencies in his lifetime. And he had artist files there of 35 millimeter slides, like slides this big and slide sheets that had documented his work. So once we understood from the slide sheets what the artworks existed at in his lifetime, we could then do the work of conservation with an amazing cure conservator, uh, Eugenie Milroy and her team um, to get the work back into shape and display it at LMCC, um, which has then become a traveling show that has had years of uh, interest and attention. So it's really been a, a really a project of a lifetime, we call it. It's curatorial in the sense that we're thinking about the narrative of Michael's practice and how to frame it in an exhibition context. And there's also conservation efforts because the work was in unopened boxes for 15 years after his passing um, to work with the wide team of, in terms of how to get it to be displayable. Yeah, it feels like more and more is revealed the more we're in the material. You mentioned working with his family to get some of these pieces. How much did they really know about his artwork? Don Dale has been our central collaborator in the work of the Michael Richards Legacy Stewardship Project. And Don is Michael's cousin. Um, she saw his exhibitions in his lifetime. He would invite her to her shows. He, she would go to the openings. But she didn't know much about the art, per se. She is a nurse, um, really great collaborator and really generous spirit, and knew very thoughtfully with vision to hold on to, the, to Michael's practice. She says in the documentary that's been created that um, you can't get rid of a man's work. And that's how she felt. So uh, she held onto the pieces in a storage unit and then her garage, but it really had been 15 years um, with no one opening the material. Um, but he had a lot of success in his lifetime. He was um, awarded esteemed artist residencies at the Whitney Independent Study Program, the Studio Museum in Harlem, international exhibitions, he was well on his way when he passed away at 38. But he was also at a moment in his career where his work wasn't yet in museum collections and private collections so much. And so the work went into the care of his family, specifically Don, um, who really thoughtfully held on to it. 
you mentioned he had very he had success in his lifetime, which he did, um, and now his legacy is kind of being relooked at 15 years later. How do you hope um, to help shape that legacy? It's been incredibly meaningful. Melissa Levin and myself as the co-curators of the retrospective and longtime collaborators stewarding Michael's practice often say that we follow in Michael's footsteps. So uh, we curated shows in New York City. The retrospective, which was in Miami, was located across the street. Uh, Mocha North Miami, where the show was, the museum is located across the street from where his solo exhibition had happened in Miami. So we're returning the work to places where his practice has had audiences. And um, it's really meaningful to be in spaces like New York City, Miami, where Michael created, created work. Um, in terms of his legacy, he was making work throughout the 1990s, addressing issues of police brutality, monuments and monumentality, anti-Blackness that was very much in the discourse at the moment, thinking about the police brutality of the Los Angeles Police Department against Rodney King and many more contexts. And at the same time, it's incredibly timely in our contemporary moment as well. These issues um, seem to be cyclical and continue to return. And so thinking about Michael's practice, both specifically in the moment of the creation of many of the sculptures and also what it means to be resurfacing this material and displaying it in contemporary art exhibitions two decades after his passing has been a, a real central part of how we think about the project of stewarding his practice. At the same time, we also have been fortunate to resurface interviews and on artist statement and artist files at the Bronx Museum and elsewhere. Michael had a two person show in his lifetime at the Bronx Museum in 1997 with artist Kathleen Lewis curated by Marisol Nieves. And there's an interview from that, which has been a really formative and influential primary source for us to quote Michael at length. So in the exhibition text for the Museum of Contemporary Art, North Miami retrospective, we quote him 20 or so times, really wanting to bring his own voice about his practice to the floor. So that feels really important to make a space for him, him to speak to his own work. Um, we located a one minute video of him speaking in his studio in, in Miami, which is one of the only videos of him and specifically videos of him talking to his artist about his artistic practice, which is incredible to hear. So um, bringing all of that into exhibitions and um, we're working towards a publication um, that'll be published in the next year or so. The show will travel to multiple venues, including hopefully, which is in the works, the Bronx Museum, where again, he had his first museum exhibition and a major two person exhibition. So um, yeah, it feels really meaningful to be thinking of all these different ways, publication, exhibition and beyond. My next question was going to be, what are some of the future plans for the exhibition? So maybe you just covered that. <laughs> well, yeah, I can speak specifically to it. Um, it's been a really incredible unfolding, I would say, in that the show has had multiple iterations. Michael's practice iterated on itself. He was thinking about themes of flight, aviation, the Tuskegee Airmen and their legacy in ways similar and disparate across sculptures and drawings and other forms. And so it's been awesome actually to have the exhibition also have kind of an iterative form in the sense that it was first shown in 2016 at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, a smaller survey called Michael Richards Winged, Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian was shown at Francis Nauman Fine Art in Manhattan in the next year in 2017. He took a sculpture called Winged to Miami Basel, the art fair, which sold to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, which was the first purchase of Michael's sculptural practice by museum since his passing. And then the show from LMCC traveled to Stanford University, the Stanford Art Gallery, which is my alma mater. And we had an academic symposium there with professors from um, art history and African and African American studies, comparative studies and race and ethnicity and other departments. And then the show traveled and grew to the retrospective size, which is about three times larger than the earlier survey exhibition 
Michael Richards' Are You Down at the Museum of Contemporary North Miami in 2021, um, which had a lot of success, was up for six months, really engaged the Miami community, also had national press attention, um, and was also on view during the 20th anniversary of September 11th, which was incredibly powerful context for the show to be on view during. And that show, because of COVID and other reasons, it's actually had a little bit of a pause, um, but it is traveling. So it'll go next to the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, March to June, 2023. We're hoping it will also um, travel to the Bronx Museum of the Arts in fall of 2024 and potentially other venues nationally and internationally. So it has its, it, it continues to have wings as, as we say. And, and at the same time, we're also working on a publication, the first monograph of Michael's practice, um, which is where our attention is really this year, 2022, and hopes to have the publication ready for the retrospective in Raleigh in the North Carolina Museum of Art. And that book is gonna feature curatorial and art historical texts by myself and Melissa Levin as co-curators, as well as a literary reflection on Michael's practice from Edwidge Danticat and um, a personal reflection on Michael as an artist and, art and creative from Perez Art Museum, Miami director, Franklin Sermons. Everyone's fascinated by the fact that he was so interested in aviation and flight and with the tragic nature of his passing, um, I think a lot of people focus on that. So how did you, I know you've spoken about this in other interviews as well, but how did you go about trying to navigate that, you know, posthumous side of his story? Yeah, we're really grateful to um, thinkers about Michael's practice who have offered the idea of afterlife of the artwork as a way to think about the, um, the ways, the uncanny, the prescient ways that his practice and his deep investment in flight and aviation rhymes with how he passed away tragically on September 11th. We've really focused our curatorial energies and attentions on the thinking that Michael had around flight and aviation in his lifetime as metaphors for uplift and downfall, thinking about the um, ways in which the Tuskegee Airmen as the first black pilots in United States military history often had to, in Michael's words, fly twice as many missions as their white counterparts and then eat in segregated barracks. So he was reflecting on these complicated ideas of heroism, democracy, American um, identity. Our curatorial efforts has, have really centered that narrative in, tell, in Michael's deep investment in the metaphor of flight and aviation. And at the same time, if you're in the exhibition space, if you learn about the story of his passing, that adds another layer of art and its afterlives to understandings and meanings of Michael's work. And so um, we've been conscious to really lead with Michael's voice in terms of how he was thinking about flight and aviation and also respect and appreciate people's deep emotional responses to the work and the ways that we can uplift and honor Michael's practice um, given his tragic passing on September 11th. What's your favorite piece of his and why? I'm really inspired by the way that all the works speak to each other. And that's maybe a deflection of the question, but I'm really moved by the, the ways that it's almost like Michael's practice is one full body of work addressing issues of duality, tension, possibilities and pitfalls, achievement and downfall, the ways that anti-Blackness structures and prohibits, and at the same time, the ways that aspiration is still always a part of life and vision. And I'm really moved by the through lines of Michael's practice. And I often think that specific sculptures stand out in specific moments. Um, so Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian, of course, really got our attention as we embarked on the process of understanding Michael's work better. A sculpture, A Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo, which specifically addresses the Los Angeles Police Department's br police brutality against Rodney King, has had really pressing resonance over the many years of the exhibitions. 
we recently in the Miami exhibition were able to um, work with artists and friends of Michael's, Luis uh, Gaspert and William Cordoba to restore a sculpture called Swing Low, which is a chariot that also plays dance hall music that hadn't been shown in over 25 years. It's Michael's Studio Museum in Harlem exhibition. And so showing that for the first time in Miami and it plays music and just really changes the energy and environment of the space really was a standout piece. So it ships. I mean, we've been with the work for about seven years now. So different moments have their different works that stand out. Um, but those are a few that, that, that always really resonate. What um, are you most grateful for from this entire experience of putting together or maybe what was a favorite moment? It feels like an immense honor and a humbling one to be able to bring Michael's practice to broader audiences. He was a really inspiring, tremendously gifted artist. When we say it's the project of a lifetime, it's really bringing Michael's life's work to the fore. And at the same time, it's really been the project of a lifetime to have the task of working on this. I also am immensely grateful to Michael's family, Dawn Dale, for her trust in us to exhibit the work in multiple ways and, and to do right by Michael's practice. I'm always incredibly grateful to Melissa Levin, co-curator and collaborator every step of the way. She's in this interview with us, even if she's not able to be in the interview with us in this moment. It's really been, immensely rewarding to be in dialogue with Michael's close friends and collaborators, as well as inspiring to hear how his work speaks to academics and artists. And um, it's just been really awesome to continue to learn about the work and how it's, how it was created, how it impacted people. Yeah, it's just one of the most meaningful things I've ever been involved in and I couldn't be more grateful and gracious about the opportunity that it's made possible. And yeah, it's just really inspiring art. And it's why I chose to be an art history major. It has deep political stakes, which is why I went back to get a PhD in history of art and African American studies and thinking about art that really matters and makes, it, makes an impact in community. So I'm really happy to be a part of the project. Thank you so much.